Welcome to the March 1st meeting of the Penfield Board of Education. This meeting is called back to order at 6.37 p.m. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is it recommended that the board approve the March 1st, 2022 agenda as submitted? So we have a motion and a second that the agenda March 1st, 2022 be approved as submitted. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. It is recommended that the board approve the consent agenda, including the approval of the minutes of February 8th as 2022 was submitted, the acceptance of the recommendation from the Committee on Special Education, the acceptance of the recommendation from the Committee on Preschool Special Education, the acceptance of the recommendation from the Superintendent for Personnel Changes, and the request to approve the following bidders that you have presented there, and the approval of the request to dispose unserviceable textbooks. So may I have a motion and a second that the consent agenda be approved. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion carries. And which we, we today we go straight to the student representative report. Uh, Lila Harvey, would you please uh, tell us what's going on? Yeah, of course. So beginning off with the district, of course, last week was February break, so many students took advantage of the time to relax and even travel um, with students at the high school going on a trip to Greece. So trip highlights included sightseeing in Athens, visiting where the Olympics began, and seeing the Parthenon. This trip was actually Mrs. Brooks' 20th trip, taking students to different countries. Um, best buddies made valentines for their friends and family. The hockey team tied with Victor and were both named co-sectional champions. Varsity cheerleading came in third place at their sectional competition. The robotics team donated non-perishables and 1,750 pairs of socks to the Dimitri house. And tickets for the spring musical, Mamma Mia, are now on sale, both online and for purchase at the high school. Key Club and the Random Acts of Kindness Club partnered together to create flyers with positive messages to brighten someone's day that are posted around the school. Um, Science Olympiad came in third place at the regional competition and will be competing at states in two weeks. At Bay Trail, students in the enrichment program visited the Garth Fagan Dance Company and were able to get a preview of their performance. At the elementary schools with Scribner, kindergartners celebrated their 100th day of school by dressing up as if they were 100 years old and had fun doing crafts and activities related to the number 100. At Cobbles, because of the Super Bowl, fourth and fifth graders played football themed music in music class. At Harris Hill, Mrs. LaFountain's class read about Amanda Gorman and discussed many of her works and her messages regarding the importance of change. <coughs> and at, in Ms. Ramsey's class, they designed and built their own bridges and tested how many pennies their respective bridges could hold. At Indian Landing, Mrs. Kaiser's class practiced community building by sharing what they love about their class. And during Indian Landing's career night, Melissa Mueller Douglas presented about her own experiences of being an entrepreneur and the process of creating her own app, Chocolate Mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And another guest was Dr. Cropper, who is an aerospace engineer. Thank you. Thank you. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Any questions or comments for, for Lila? No? Good, thank you very much. Which brings us Again, right to the superintendent's report, Dr. Putnam. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, this evening we have some student and staff honors. I have just a couple of updates, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Driffle for business updates as we continue to build towards our budget vote in May. So national merit finalists, congratulations to our PHS senior, Catherine Healy, who moved on to become a finalist in the 2022 National Merit Scholarship Competition. Science Olympiad uh, brought home third place in the regional competition and qualifying for the state finals on March 18th at Lemoyne College. 
the Go Red campaign over at Cobbles. They raised $173 for American Heart Association. And uh, Have a Heart, Scrivener students and families collected and donated their, uh, for the Penfield Food Shelf during their Have a Heart um, drive in February. And the PHS Student Advisory Council held the drive to collect food and supplies for the families who were recently displaced by the fire at the Pines of Parrington, which I just want to note that um, as, uh, as superintendents, I appreciate uh, Brett Provisano in terms of the work they did. We reached out as well in terms of how we could support any of their students. Um, and I just love that fact that when uh, unfortunate things happen, including in, a, in a, a district next to us, but are not our students or residents, um, the fact that our students really stepped up and, and it was their idea. I just think it's so great. So, uh, and then the Cobbles Food Drive, uh, Caring Council uh, donated uh, food uh, to the Penfield Food Shelf during the month of February. And then I just have updates. Believe it or not, I am uh, once again going to talk about COVID-19, uh, as I've done for the last two years at every board meeting. And uh, I know our community is aware that the governor announced that masks will become optional for K-12 schools starting tomorrow, which is Wednesday, March 2nd. The following data points were referenced in her decision, a 98% drop in the positive cases since the peak in January 2022, uh, 51 consecutive days of a downward trend, seven day average, which is currently a 1.7% compared to 23% back at the January peak, declining hospitalization rates for 48 consecutive days, high vaccination rates among adults and children. As of 2 p.m., and I can change that because I've been monitoring my email, as of 6.44 p.m., <laughs> we are still waiting for official written guidance from New York State as well as an FAQ document that they, were, uh, they will provide. I will just uh, uh, say thank you to our board and our administrators, our teachers, our staff, our parents, our students, because uh, March 13th, uh, which is rapidly approaching, is the two-year date since I was um, held a press conference to say we think we're going to be able to stay open. Uh, and then Monday we were closed uh, for the rest <laughs> of the year. So. Um, you know, there is definitely frustration that decisions are made without the guidance to help us as schools, but we've been used to this. This has been two years of this. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, I'm sure. And so, you know, we continue to update our COVID-19 webpage uh, every Wednesday with all active COVID cases in the district. The numbers I have up now are just for the month of February. Um, so we started on February 2nd with 41 active cases. The following week on the 9th, it was 28. February 16th, it was 13. And on the 23rd, which was during break, it was um, 11 cases. And so that is uh, a 0.2% infection rate uh, of active cases in our district. Uh, and that's simply just taking the 11 active cases and based on the number of staff and students we have district-wide. And so while masking for staff and students will become optional starting tomorrow, March 2nd, we will maintain our other safety protocols, such as our classroom sanitiza sanitizing, uh, hand washing, hand sanitizer stations. Um, we'll remain in regular contact with um, our county health officials and we'll communicate any changes uh, or adjustments as required. Um, we understand that, that um, the guidance that's forthcoming is going to say that the counties do have some ability to uh, make masks maybe mandatory or put other things into place based on the transmission rate in their county. So our transmission rate, I, I met with Dr. Mendoza and members of the health department today, is low. We're in the low moderate range. Um, our, we continue to look at our, our um, health officials for uh, guidance. And they are also comfortable with a move to optional masking based on hospitalization rates, our um, vaccination rates in the area, and our cases. And so we're going to keep monitoring, but right now we're looking at this as really the biggest change now is masking from required to optional. Um, an email did go out prior to this meeting to our community that it, it that also includes, as our understanding, is buses. So buses would also be optional. We weren't sure about that. And we will um, you know, continue to monitor and uh, update as needed. We do have, and this was shared with families, we do have uh, from the county and state, 
a number of uh, KN95 masks, both for adults and they refer to as pe a pediatric mask for a smaller face. Uh, those are in all of our nurses' offices and uh, staff who want to wear one of those masks or students uh, can just stop in and get one and we'll monitor those numbers. We're also continuing to get from the state um, at home tests, which we will continue to share out and provide. The guidance that we're awaiting, we're, we're not sure, but our understanding is that there will be changes to uh, isolation, quarantine, how if you have symptoms, if you need a PCR test in order to return to school, we believe those things will change as well as distancing requirements in schools. But until we can get that guidance and really digest it and look through it and understand it, our, our really the only change you'll see coming into school tomorrow is that students, staff um, may uh, choose not to wear a mask. And so we'll uh, continue to keep you updated as we go through. Questions? Board members, questions or comments? Lisa. I have a question. If a parent wants to get um, one of the K95 or and whatever, what are we doing? A uh, they're I KN95. KN95s, thank you. Um, for like a younger student, should they email the nurse or call or how how would they do that yep i would so if they're um uh want their child to pick one of those masks up in the nurse's office they could just reach out to the classroom teacher or the principal um however they feel and and will send the student down or, or deliver it to the classroom based on the school it's a great question thank you yep and i and, and just so you know because i thought you're gonna ask a different question which is that we don't have enough masks to provide to anybody. It would just be students and staff, mm -hmm. but they're still providing those through the county and state at, um, at certain locations. Pharmacies, Wegmans are still uh, re receiving those, and, and you can get three at a time um, from those locations. I yes, do have I mean, a uh, Catherine. Um, you had mentioned that the state is giving counties uh, leeway or whatever. So do you know if the county is going to act as one for all districts or if if um, cases go up here there there's a smattering over in this district or that will that count for the whole county or how, do you know how that's going to work um so i think i i would tell you that without the guidance i can't speak specifically oh, true. but in speaking with the county they uh and and i know um, adam bello uh, spoke they are not looking to add anything to our knowledge in terms of making any um, requirements for the county. Okay. Um, in terms of what happens at each individual school, mm -hmm. just like they've been doing from the beginning of COVID, is sort of each situation is will be okay. looked at. Now, what's interesting is that you know the state and and therefore the county has really backed away from the quarantining in terms of that contact tracing. And if you remember back like two years ago, if you were around somebody, you were getting quarantined for 10 days. Now that the vaccination rates are much higher, mm -hmm. really following the Omicron um, strain is that it is um, you know, not impacting those with vaccinations and our students very, um, uh, you know, not as, it's not as severe. Yeah. And so we don't see or, or believe that there'll be like a full contact tracing, mm -hmm. but really more of that communication that if you feel there's a need or you're worried that you were near somebody, it's those home tests that we're getting. Also the town, uh, the town of Penfield has received a, a large number of those tests and they'll be delivering those to the Penfield library and being sharing those out as well. So it really starts to, to really, and, and Dr. Mendoza mentioned this, and I talked about it last meeting, is that shift from pandemic to endemic. Yeah. So, you know, if you look at it like the flu and you, and you say, okay, so if you've been around somebody with the flu, you probably are gonna monitor your symptoms. If you're, you know, if, you're, if your spouse or your child has the flu and you start feeling a little funny, then maybe it is the flu and you might wanna stay home and you might wanna go uh, see the doctor or have, in this case, take a, take a COVID at home test. Right. So that's where we are right now. And I will say that <coughs> I've shared from day one that although my title says doctor, that is not a medical doctor, <laughs> and I'm not here to argue, debate, yeah. sort of COVID and, and what we're doing, why we're doing it, but we are gonna continue to follow those state mandates. And at this point, it's, it's optional masking starting tomorrow. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Kristen. So I know we're still waiting on guidance from the state, are we still following the flow charts that were in place? If so, let's say I mm -hmm. have a COVID symptom. Do I need to test as a student negative? Do I need a negative PCR test to return to school? So that's the question we don't know, okay. to be very honest. So right now, they, 
uh, and we got to wait on the guidance. There has been discussion that maybe an at-home test could be used, and then it really gets back to the trust factor, trust factor. right? So, so we don't want people to come to school sick, and and people don't want to come to school sick. And I think as parents, the piece of you know hanging on to your kid if they have the flu makes sense. So, but what we're finding in, in talking with the county department of health is a number of the kids with symptoms now wasn't this way before, but like in the beginning of January. But a lot of the students with symptoms or adults with symptoms, it's not turning out to be COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Because of everything we talked about that the governor used as her data metric points on why we're moving to optional masking. Um, so that really is the question I think is is going to be really important that we don't have that answer. But right now, if you have symptoms. Um, you know, especially if they're severe, it would be it would be going home and potentially needing a COVID test. But be really clear, that's the one of those big questions we don't have an answer to until that guidance comes out. Thank you. All right. So I just feel like to add, I think you know, just repeat since we're really came up to this point. What we had said at a previous meeting is, again, the the guidance, the timing of the guidance is not what we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, when it does come out, it may there may be areas of ambiguity that we need clarification on. So just because it comes out tomorrow doesn't mean we know exactly what to do tomorrow. So yep. we ask people just to be patient as we try to figure out what's going on. And as Tom said, he talks to the county. We, we, we go back to the state because everyone will have the same questions and we'll get clarification. And the place to get those answers is on our district webpage, not Facebook. I think that's a very fair mark and I would just mention too is that as we look to look at the guidance and, and look at the FAQ document and try to determine how we make things happen in school because every school even now looks a little different the one thing that was always the same was universal masking so mm -hmm. now it's it's optional so the one piece that we'll continue to look at is right now the only change is masking everything else we're going to continue to try to keep in place until we can look at that guidance digest it and, and make decisions and we'll communicate like you said with through our facebook and through emails to our our staff students and families thank you okay um, i will now turn it over to dr driffle good evening board <coughs> hope everybody's doing well uh, I have some budget development updates for you this evening. Um, so here we are in the budget development process. Uh, we're into March now. Um, we have a relatively brief update tonight on both the expenditure and revenue side. Not a lot of new information as it pertains to last meeting, um, but we do have some new information. So <coughs> we have upcoming um, meetings. Uh, March 22nd, we'll have further budget budget information. Hopefully at that point, we have an idea of what the state budget's gonna look like. Typically, the Senate and the Assembly release their one house budgets somewhere in the middle of uh, March. So that'll give us kind of good indications where the legislative budget is uh, progressing, moving into April. Um, in our meeting on April 12th, we'll have a, a budget to consider for the board um, to bring to the community and the May vote come May 17th. And our budget hearing before that will be on May 3rd. So we're, we're moving through the process. So uh, what's going on? Um, we have started the initial request for services related to the BOCES budget. Um, current estimates were revised downward that you'll see this evening, um, about $200,000 relative to what we thought they were gonna be. So, so positive development there. We're still monitoring learning, learner needs. Uh, March is a busy time of year for annual evaluations. We're monitoring enrollment information. Um, as a data point at this point, we have about 205 kindergarten registrations and we're expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of like 335 um, by the time we get to September. So still a ways to go there. We always try to get people to register as early as possible, but it's one of those things that we really, it's almost like a daily process that we're really trying to monitor those. And then the associated staffing um, supports based on class sizes and, and student needs. So. Um, over the course of the next month, we'll have a clearer picture of what that all looks like and how it pertains to the budget. We have ongoing advocacy efforts. I know it's been a busy month for NISBA, Aniscus, and ASBO. Uh, and as you know, we have ongoing collective bargaining with some of our units set to expire at the end of this fiscal year. So uh, here's the all, all up, all in um, functional domain look at next year's projected budget as it stands here on March 1st. So these are the different um, cost code centers, uh, so to speak, across the district. Uh, we have Board of Education costs of $10,000. This is a projected increase as it relates to the streaming services, the video packages for these meetings. 
central office relates to the superintendent's office, the business and finance team, uh, the human resource team, director of communications, legal auditing services uh, of about $150,000. Central services, we'll kind of unpack a little bit more this evening. It relates to operations and maintenance, um, but also has a sl small sliver of um, our security here at the district. Uh, we've invited our director of facilities, Mr. George English, who uh, in a few moments will come up and speak a little bit about their operation and the board will have an opportunity to ask him many questions as it relates to their finances or um, just the operational issues they're running into this year. So central services, as I said, we'll, we'll touch on in a minute, but a big projected increase of almost half a million dollars. Special items primarily relates to our BOCES administrative costs. It's about um, $800,000 of the 1.1 million associated there. Curricular administration relates to all of the main offices in our six schools. Uh, it also includes the Office of Equity and Access and the Office of Curriculum and Instruction and all the associated professionals that work in those different offices. Uh, function 21 relates to teaching in school. So this is just all of our classroom instruction, uh, all of the, the teachers, the professional learning, um, the materials, the supplies, the BOCES costs that go into um, just day-to-day -day instruction in our classrooms. Special programs includes both um, students with disabilities and vocational, occupational education programs. So this is an area where I still um, think the number is a little bit conservative. Uh, I think in the course of the next month, we'll have a better understanding of what this looks like. We are seeing a big jump in projected enrollment in the career and technical <coughs> education, potentially 20 kids. Um, so these are wonderful programs. Um, they, they run through BOCES, you have new visions for health, and there's um, some really positive things there, but they are expensive placements. They're about $10,000 each, so you're talking about a $200,000 um, line item jump. Um, instructional media relates to our libraries and our instructional technology programs. Pupil services is all the wraparound supports that our students receive. That's the guidance office, that's psychologists, that's social workers. Um, it also relates to our co-curricular clubs and our interscholastic athletics. <laughs> Transportation, we did a deep dive last time. Um, registration uh, is just our census enumerator. Employee benefits, um, up a little over $1.5 million. Uh, debt service, as we discussed last time, seeing a significant decrease this year, almost 8% or half a million dollars. And then those interfund transfers that go to the special aid fund to cover um, special education costs during the summer and any um, shortfall with the food service operation. So if you look at, um, central services, teaching school, special programs, and employee benefits, that makes up about 85% of the new dollars um, in next year's budget. So relative to where we were last time, this is down about $250,000. Um, so it represents right now a year-over-year -year increase of 4.7%. Last meeting, we were at about 4.9%. Um, so a, a positive trajectory, but <coughs> we'll kind of, I think, settle somewhere in this 4-6 range four or seven range um, as we learn more over the next month. So here's just a visual representation of those functional budget domains. Um, you can really quickly see that most of the money, um, the outflows of the district are tied up in classroom in instruction and those special programs. And then the associated employee, employee benefits for um, the professional staff, followed by debt service, pupil services, um, the central services, curricular administration, and so on. So in accordance with our budget development calendar, we are going to take kind of a, a deeper look at operations and maintenance tonight. Um, so the first area I wanted to look at is operations. So this relates to the building-based staff as opposed to the K-12-based staff. So when you see staff here, this is our uh, cleaners, it's our custodians, first shift, second shift, and third shift. Uh, projected uh, personnel costs uh, of a 10% increase for next year. This relates to the wage pressures that we've discussed around the minimum wage increases and just the general staffing shortages that we've seen regionally. Uh, utilities, uh, we discussed last time and we'll kind of unpack a little bit more in a moment, but seeing a big increase um, for next year. So even before the events of the last week, kind of introducing uncertainty into the natural gas and oil markets, um, we were seeing big increases, particularly in the fall. They'd kind of dipped a little bit in November and December, um, but they're starting to pick back up again. If you look at like the futures pricing, um, there's definitely some concerns there. So uh, it's, a, it's a big jump. I, I do think it's conservative. As you'll see in a moment, um, it's still lower than we've been historically, not, not so long ago. 
Um, but relative to the last handful of years, it is a big uh, dollar increase. Our service contracts um, projected to stay the same. So these are like the controls that we have for the district, um, HVAC um, repairs, things like that. Professional development stays the same. Our BOCES costs increased just $5,000 and custodial supplies are just the um, sort of consumable cleaning products that we have um, throughout the district. So the operations realm is um, projected at this point to increase $440,000 or a little over 11%. So here is a historical look at those gas and electric costs. Um, you can see next year we're projected to be a little over a million dollars again. It would be the highest we've been in about 10 years. Um, but still, relative to where we were back in 07, 08, um, a little less um, total-wise and relative to the size of the budget, considerably less than we were back then. Um, so while it's negative news relative to the last couple years, as I said, um, it's important to have the context that it, it has been worse. Um, so we'll keep an eye on it. Um, this is something that we competitively bid, so we're going to get the best pricing. Um, you know, we're a large customer, so we get better rates than your residential home. Um, but at the same time, it'll be something that we're definitely going to be monitoring throughout the year next year. As it relates to maintenance, this is um, more like the K-12 spectrum. So it's our um, it's our groundskeepers, it's the maintenance mechanics, it's kind of the, the labor foreman. Um, less uh, changes this year on this side, uh, projected uh, wage increases of a little over 3%, and then everything else stays the same. We have a equipment replacement schedule um, that's in line. It's a five-year replacement schedule. Next year, we're projected to replace one truck, two vans, and an auto scrubber. Uh, and then we have um, projected repairs costs of a little over half a million dollars, grounds costs of $350,000. BOCES cost of $20,000 and then general supplies of $115,000. Uh, so at this point, I will we'll stop talking and I will invite Mr. Um, George English, our Director of Facilities, to join us. <coughs> George, that clicker should work, but if it does not, let me know and I could kind of just the click first trick of the All night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. Good evening, Good everyone. You Thank you for having me. Um, I, I couldn't start out tonight without sharing with you the excitement of our new facility and the planning that's going into that. Uh, it is a little stressful, but <laughs> <laughs> it, because there's a, you know, it, we need to make sure we get it right. But uh, so I'll touch on that. I'll touch on our current funding, uh, touch on our staffing and payroll. And then I, I have a few photos of our fantastic team to share. So, um, yeah. So uh, as far as the new facility, want to say thank you for helping move that forward for us um you know our, our current facility clearly is is one of the poorest in the county and so we you know really need that update and it's really exciting that we're getting to do that at the same time it's 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 a it's a heavy burden <laughs> we want to make sure we do it right because we get the chance to do it once uh and it's we, we realize how important it is to do it right and to to make sure it's good for our district for many many years so uh, we, we did visit three different facilities with quite a lot of the team, uh, trying to make sure we're incorporating and looking at the right things. Um, and so we're, we're working hard with our architects and engineers on that. So thank you for that. Um, current funding, want to say thank you for that. Um, our, our staff in general uh, is very pleased with the equipment tools, supplies, what they have to do their job. And I want to point out, you know, and you're going to see our staffing again, <laughs> but um, if, if it weren't for the equipment and the uh, funding that's provided for that equipment and those tools, we really would be hurting. Mm -hmm. But um, and I, in one of my pictures, I have a very expensive tool that I'll show you that if it weren't for that tool, we would have spent all of last week making a plumbing repair but because of the three thousand dollar tool that we're able to buy we we're able to make that repair in an afternoon so huh. just want to say thank mm -hmm. you for that um, and then uh, staffing similar picture the last time I presented um, we do have one custodian vacancy that we didn't have then but I do want to point out that all of our vacancies since I've been here have come from retirements it's, I mean, our payroll, it, you know, our wage rates aren't awesome. And hopefully we're going to 
be able to correct that with the next contract and then be able to start attracting some new people. But our, our people enjoy working at Penfield. We have a great team. And you know, even though the pay isn't the best right now, they're invested in, and I am super grateful for the group we have. So, um, and you know, I, I'm, we, we did hire one cleaner recently. We're hoping we have a second one. <laughs> We're kind of negotiating there. They, the, we thought the, the cleaner was starting Monday and Monday they sent an email saying, I'd like $15 an hour. <laughs> we had to say, ah, sorry, but the contract is. So um, we're hoping that this Monday we'll have a second cleaner. So that there is some movement. Um, so I am grateful for that. <coughs> um, Payroll wise, I do hope we have a bump in the coming year. But I also hope that we can control our overtime a little better than we are right now. <coughs> And if it wasn't for our staff that's committed to our district and putting in overtime hours that they are, that would be very troubling for us as well. So I, I want to really recognize our staff and thank, you know, and it's not every single one of them doesn't work 10, 15 hours of overtime every week, but a lot of them do. And so thank you to them. And so just uh, this crew is putting in a lot of overtime some nights. <laughs> I feel bad for Jim uh, Cleveland. He's our head groundsman. Um, you know, it's a lot of weight on his shoulders as far as, okay, should we come in at four? Should we come in at two? What time should I call the, the guys in? Um, they came in this past Saturday because it snowed all day Friday. Mm -hmm. There was a basketball game Saturday. So anyways, I, I, wow. they're a great group. Uh, there's a couple of people missing. Uh, Jim Laforte, who's with uh, transportation, helps us with uh, snow plowing so we appreciate him and then Scott Alaco which he's pictured later so uh, but this group uh, is what makes our parking lots and sidewalks safe for us uh, a couple of maintenance guys uh, working they over the break we put in a wall and um, a door to create a new office area in the high school counseling suite uh, you know there with all the needs that we have they're just needing more space. And so uh, thankfully we have the guys with the expertise. Uh, Vitaly, who is pictured on the right, uh, is our courier and we don't have a painter right now. Oh. So he's on overtime most of the time is when he's having to do this, he's sanding and painting for us. So I'm really grateful for him. And here's our plumbing repair. Um, Scott Alaco is the one on the step ladder he wears shorts all <laughs> winter long <laughs> um, he helps snow plow but but that tool he's using is the pro press tool that i referred to and not every district is able to afford those not every district has those right now but i can't tell you how much it saved us as far as time and uh, you can see the water dripping still yeah. um, y normally you'd be sweating the pipes and you got to figure out how to shut that water off that there's a valve somewhere that we close that it's not qu so then it just creates more and more work and it just keeps building and building so anyways uh thankful for the team but also thankful for the tools we have so and they were able to get this repair done and no longer do we have a leak in the high school hall wow. <laughs> so that was awesome and then our head custodians um you know the, their group uh including you know the head custodians and the cleaners great group of people have really stepped up over the past couple of years. Jordan uh, St. John, who is our head custodian at the at uh, Bay Trail, and Scribner is missing from the picture. He's a very tall, imposing gentleman. Um, and so I, his grandmother passed away, and so I wasn't able to get him mm -hmm. in the picture. But I do greatly appreciate our, our custodial team as well. So. And that's all I have for this evening. Oh. But I mean, we have a great team. Yeah. We, we, we really do. And, and we appreciate the support we have from our leaders here and from our board. So thank you. Just to be fair, the reason that we haven't had 
many snow days is because your crew is so good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Don't blame <laughs> <laughs> It's because he's a tough guy. He said, no, get it cleared now and get, <laughs> get us it to school. So, uh, thank all right, you. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Thank you, George. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, George. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, so um, other side of the ledger as it relates to um, budgeting. Uh, the spring is kind of this this art of trying to balance the expenditures and the anticipated revenues. Um, so today is March 1st. We did submit the tax levy calculation that we had reviewed in the prior two meetings to, to the state. Um, don't anticipate any issues with that. Uh, as a review, it did allow for a 3.64% levy increase. Um, so as long as we were to keep our levy for next year at or under that percentage, it would just require a simple majority at the May vote. Um, at this point, if the um, New York State legislative budget that Governor Hochul had outlined in her executive address um, does match what she was putting forward, I do not think we're going to have to levy up to, to the tax cap. Um, obviously, there are caveats with that. I don't know exactly what the legislative budget is going to look like, when it's due in a month from now. But I can say, um, at least pretty confidently at this point, that I don't think we're gonna have to be up to a 3.64% tax levy. Um, we are also monitoring, as I discussed before, she did propose the homeowner tax rebate credit. So that would be a one-time um, tax rebate to all of the residents of New York State that are homeowners. Um, it's a tiered percentage based on family income um, and then a percentage of the star savings. So whether or not you get the enhanced star savings or the regular star savings, it would be a percentage of that. I can bring a potential calculation to our next meeting so residents might have um, a better understanding of what that could mean for them. But from preliminary estimates, it it's could be substantial, hundreds of dollars. Um, likely would um, almost certainly uh, make up for any kind of tax increase that the school is have to impart. Um, so a positive development that we'll keep an eye on and I'm sure will be part of advocacy efforts in the next month or so. And then um, here in Penfield, um, we, we know there is a reassessment happening. So we're going to work in the weeks and, and what will actually be months ahead to really understand how that affects the rates, the tax rates. So it is complicated. Um, Penfield is just one of our six towns um, across two different counties. Um, so we'll have um, some preliminary information hopefully at our next meeting as it relates to assessments. And then we'll have more information at our public budget hearing on May 3rd with updated numbers hopefully that come out May 1st. But then ultimately the board doesn't adopt the budget and tax rates until August because the, the role isn't final until July 1st. So we'll do everything we can to provide accurate um, projections, but in this kind of fluid environment we'll have to recognize that there'll be probably a little wiggle between the numbers that we get next week and what the numbers are come July. Um, so something that we always keep an eye on throughout the spring. So as I mentioned before, just some next steps on our budget. Um, it's a continuous day-to-day -day process. At our next meeting, we'll review the BOCES budget um, in more detail as we get more finality on what that's gonna look like. As I said, we're hopeful for that early tax rate information in New York State budget news. Um, we have a board meeting on April 12th. We'll have a, a, a budget consideration for the board to adopt. Our budget hearing <coughs> is scheduled for May 3rd um, here at PHS. I think it's at right at 6.30. Uh, and then the statewide vote is the third Tuesday of May. It's May 17th. Um, this year, we only have two um, propositions on the ballot, the operating budget and uh, three board of education seats, two of which are three-year terms and one is a one-year term to replace the vacant position. Um, so board, any questions or comments as it relates to the budget development process? Board members? Lisa? Um, I, I was actually curious about what George had brought up about overtime and like what that looks like currently and then do we account for that in next year's budget because we anticipate continued shortages or how, how do we do that yep so to mr english's credit he, he manages it it's not just um it's not just on the facility side it's happening a lot in transportation as well okay. so a lot of our mechanics have been driving um, outside of their normal hours so we've had more overtime this year than in, in past years 
um, but due to the savings on not having those unfulfilled positions, budget-wise, it's been neutral at, at best and probably a little bit more in the favor. We really prefer to have people in those right. spots mm -hmm. um, because you know the risk is is that we're thankful that everybody is you know working and we're, we're glad they're earning some overtime, but at the same time that we risk burnout too. Um, so we, we'd much rather fulfill those positions. I am, the budget does consider um, a projected pay increase. It does project hopefully filling some of those um, vacant positions, but at the same time, there is still um, money set aside for potential overtime costs as well. Thank you. Yep. Board members. I have a question. So it goes back to our utilities increase that we're projecting. Mm -hmm. Um, when our costs went down, and this might be two f for two reasons, was it in regards to or because of our competitive bids that we were able to secure, or was it due to some cost um, saving measures that we were able to do as a district? Um, or is it, a, it might be a combo? Yep, it, it's definitely a combination. So we, um, we do purchase competitive um, on, on the supply side for, for gas and electric. Um, the other part of that is we have done some things for s sustainability, converting to LED. We have controls that, um, you know, change the time when, if we know people aren't going to be in the building and adjust the HVAC. And then third, um, realistically, in the last five years, the, the market has been priced really well in the energy domains. A lot of that was due to just kind of hydro fracking, flooding the market mm -hmm. and driving costs down. It was just, you know, not so long ago that a barrel of oil was at a negative cost. Now we're up over $100 again. Um, so it's just kind of the ebb and flow of the market conditions. Um, so I would love to take more credit for those lower costs, but mm -hmm. it was primarily more attributed to just market conditions. Thank you. All right. Good. That you. concludes superintendent reports. Thank you, everybody. Brings us to visitor speaking time. So as a board, we appreciate the comments of the community during the public session of the board meeting. Every individual that speaks has a vested interest in the education of our students. Now, your comments are important to us, but matters involving particular individuals or specifics of negotiation are not permitted during public session. Concerns raised will be referred to the district administration for follow-up or action when appropriate. Visitors may sign up to speak uh, at a meeting by emailing the district clerk, Sharon Erkfitz, with your name, address, phone number, and topic you wish to address. Registration will open at 8 a.m. on the Friday before the meeting and remain open until 3 p.m. on the Tuesday of the board meeting. Speakers are expected to identify themselves with their name and address before presenting and limit their comments to three minutes or less. The total of 30 minutes will be allotted for visitor speaking time. The board will not be responding to the comments during the session, but please be assured we are listening. And finally, we ask that all speakers model the conduct that we expect from our students in school daily. Please be respectful of others in your words, conduct, and demeanor. Thank you. So we have, we have one speaker today, uh, Ms. Kristen Turgeon. Hello, Ms. Turgeon, please state your name and address. Kristen Turgeon, 67 Cobbles Drive. I came here several months ago to show support for this Board of Education and for the administration when seats were filling with people spewing hate over masks and critical race theory. I joined many parents who stepped up to say we supported anti-racism curriculum, diversifying staff, and keeping our students safe during a pandemic. We came in the hopes that if you saw the number of parents and community members that want change that you would act swiftly. At that time, I also said that I would be pushing for more. So I'm back. I'd like to first address masking. I have three kids at Cobbles Elementary, and I know for a fact that each of their teachers is a direct caretaker for either a child that is too young to be vaccinated or an elderly parent who falls into the vulnerable category. That's three out of three. You have a choice with this decision. Each school district is able to make a choice. You are choosing to prioritize able-bodied, healthy individuals. I know there are neurodiverse, neurodiverse kids that have struggled with mask wearing, but let's be clear, this decision is not about them. It's for the loud people that don't believe they have an obligation to care for our community. 
You pride yourself on social emotional teachings and talk about community circles, but it's empty and meaningless when the lesson given to my six year old is that he doesn't have any responsibility to the most vulnerable in our community. You are directly hindering my children in developing empathy and now I have to work against this message. It is heartbreaking that our most vulnerable students get the message that they simply don't matter. Which brings me to the issue of anti-racism and creating an affirming and inclusive environment within our school. We showed up months ago hoping you would act swiftly to make changes in our school so our BIPOC students felt seen and heard. We are now beyond halfway, the halfway mark in this school year and we are still having BIPOC students in all of our schools telling us daily that they don't feel seen, heard, or respected. You have an opportunity to change that every day. We are told these things take time, that you're working on it and that we have to meet people where they're at. This would all be understandable, even acceptable, if we hadn't been asking for these changes for years, and in most case, decades. Many of our BIPOC scholars are children of Penfield alumni. Why is it that their children are having to deal with the same things they had to deal with themselves decades ago? We are told Penfield teachers want ownership of the new curriculum and want to be the ones to create it, and yet, look at the demographics of our teachers in this district. In both elementary and secondary, it's 97% white. We must go outside Penfield staff and we cannot rely on the free labor of the community members with these identities to do the work. We must hire and pay people who have the expertise from life to lead this mission. Without using this framework to explore all aspects of the district, without ensuring we have staff from underrepresented groups, without clearly and consistently creating environments where everyone feels safe to participate, it is all lip service. The Penfield Anti-Racist Alliance has requested a public dashboard to make sure the community is kept up to date on progress. We also want action from you, the school board. We want you to publicly endorse these efforts. We want you to participate in the anti-racist education that teachers will be experiencing. We want you to sponsor forums to educate our parents, students, and our community on what cultural humility is, and most important, on what systemic racism and white supremacy has meant for our community. Thank you, Ms. Turgeon. All right, that concludes visitor speaking time. Um, let's see, Monroe County School Board Association committee meetings, uh, information exchange. Ms. Dean, yes. thank you for taking that on yeah. since we had that, uh, that opening there. Yeah, and, and I was able to, Tom and I were at a very interesting in information exchange on um, February 9th. So um, this was all about the solar eclipse that is going to occur in 2024 in April of 2024 in Rochester New York is right on, in the path and so what's very exciting well scary at the same time is the amount of people that is expected to flock to Western New York from Eastern New York and other areas because we are Buffalo Rochester like they showed the map of this big huge line of where it's going to be mm -hmm. which is very exciting but it's going to pose some real challenges the um, eclipse is going to occur on monday april 8th it starts at 207 p.m and ends at 4 33 p.m in the um the museum zip code of 14607 so various zip codes it'll be off by a minute or whatever it will be and that um, that could be a school day and it could be a school day where all the buses and people are coming to pick up their students mm -hmm. so um, the presentation was all about who's going to be involved uh, libraries schools community centers to help coordinate the influx of people that are going to be here how we're going to manage um, school dismissal is this going to be during a break were you we don't know yet because or, or do you know no, we don't we don't know right that's one of the the big pushes is that if it's a school day um they gave an example i believe it was a missouri area where where the last eclipse sort of went through yeah and it was like 11 hours of traffic to get out because yeah. people typically leave within within about two hours of the end of the eclipse and so that falls at dismissal and so, you know, how, how just trying to be planful of what this could look like um, for our students. But on the same token, like just saying no school does become an equity issue in regards to we also don't want students at home 
without any you know, support staring at a solar eclipse because well, it will Yes, and that was, be bad. A, yes. Yep. It, there's a very big concern about that mm -hmm. because, you know, you could do, so, I mean, it would be kind of hard to stare at the sun without pain to your eyes. Right. However, you can cause a great deal of damage. So that is a concern about having younger ones being unsupervised during the eclipse. Other things um, that, well, I should mention her name, Hillary Olson. She's president and CEO of the Rochester Museum and Science Center, and she gave this wonderful presentation. She says that um, what she feels schools need to consider are the school buses that, like Tom just mentioned, that um, students are not stuck on the bus during the eclipse. And um, there's a lot more, uh, you know, Section 5 needs to be part of the consideration. Will, you know, sports events be occurring during this time? Um, and other athletic events. And then the museum would like to talk to SED about no school that day. Mm -hmm. And Sherry Johnson mentioned that the district superintendents will work with uh, SED to make sure that school officials are aware of the impact that the eclipse will have on the schools. And this eclipse is going to be, oops, it's going to, thank you, Barb. <laughs> it's going to be profound because it's going to be a total eclipse. And mm -hmm. it's going to be dark. And she says that the animals react. Um, the insects start chirping and making lots of noises. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's like this, it's amazing. It's just amazing. So. Um, you know, it's not going to be something where people are, oh, okay, yeah, there was an eclipse today. It's going to be noticeable, it's going to be big, and there's going to be lots of people who, there's people who come from all over the world to follow these eclipses. It's pretty amazing. Um, so the museum will be speaking um, at the NISBA conference to make all school districts aware of the planning that needs to take place, and they would also like to speak with the regents, too. Uh, there was a question and answer period. There were a few questions um, about curriculum uh, lessons and rural schools. There's, you know, certain considerations based on where certain schools are located. Um, here's what she said. The experience of an eclipse is, quote, magical and almost like a religious experience. To have the chance to experience an eclipse is an issue of equity. And the museum would like all families, school children, children in daycare, and adults to have access to the educational information around the eclipse and the opportunity to safely view it. And the museum will have, um, there will be access to the, what do they call them, the sun glasses or, you know, those safety glasses that you can um, safely watch the eclipse. And there's going to be a lot more information to come. But here we are in 2022 talking about an event that's coming two years down the mm -hmm. road. Um, but as you can see, like I, I was just excited to go and hear about the eclipse. But then when you think how it's going to really have an impact about um, school, work, um, animals, uh, us, everybody, yeah. you know, um, it's going to be a very big deal. And there's going to be a lot of planning that needs to take place and it's started and it could be cloudy then yeah. we uh, are it's Rochester it's right. Rochester right. <laughs> so it is he a, did say that is true if it's cloudy it's there is no eclipse right. there right. is an eclipse we just can't see it right. it so. won't be it won't be nearly <laughs> the effect yeah. but I mean, I uh, to we're <laughs> right well no she did bring that up too but I I got caught up in the, <laughs> the profoundness of it all and um, the in, uh, you know incredible opportunity um, should everything align and we can witness it. Right. Okay. So you know there's a better than 50/50 chance, yep. a little bit better. <laughs> yep. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed. But nevertheless, uh, lots of planning needs to be done, and um, that's what the presentation was about. Oh wait a minute, we have in the notes here. Let me see what it says. Another consideration is there is a um, 49 percent chance of it being cloudy that day. If it is partly cloudy, we will see a little of the eclipse. If, if it is very cloudy, the experience will be that it gets dark. So we're still going to be quite aware of it. And you know, with the preparations, no, you need to be proactive. Absolutely. 
absolutely. We've actually talked to George English and uh, his crew is going to make sure it's sunny. That Good. Day. <laughs> I think I think that's uh, move those I think that's a great thing. <laughs> we just you know I, I Catherine really I, I hope you know the, the enthusiasm of that was an incredible information exchange. It really it was. It really and, was. And I came back and and interrupted Dr. Maloney in a meeting because <laughs> she was with Nicole Whitehead, our director of STEM. Um, to look at really the curricular side of things too is an opportunity for really to make sure just you know, we're focused on Penfield but countywide yeah. this is something that I think they said you know like the next time it'll happen is 120 years from now that it'll go through Rochester it's really rare that it actually goes right it'll like Rochester yeah. is one of the peak places to, to view it and so yeah. um, hopefully it's sunny but even around the education piece of making sure that our students K-12 can can understand why what it is and uh, I think it's pretty cool and, and we can we can put out all that good intention right now for a sunny day. Sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, unless Tom, there was anything else you wanted to fill in? I that ba that was basically it. No, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad, uh, Catherine, that you uh, were able to to work that and join because I've been a lonely superintendent Aww. at those information exchanges. I know. So <laughs> no, nice. and I, I'm glad I could be there too. So that really worked out. Yeah. That's good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Catherine? All right. Uh, labor relations. Barb. Well, then we go from the solar eclipse to labor relations, which was held on February 16th at um, the Doubletree. It was very well attended, including Dr. Putnam and Dr. Kenny were there. Um, the beginning part of the meeting um, was just standard procedure. There were no status of current resignations um, countywide. Um, so we went right into our presentation, which was given by um, Allison Marley um, Esquire. And it was about New York marijuana use law and what it means for schools. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I should tell you that um, Nancy Pickering made sure that for um, dessert, there were brownies. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Thank so um, <laughs> Allison did a, an, an amazing job. I mean, it's a very complicated, um, well, I thought it was yeah. complicated um, impact that, that is going to be going on with the marijuana laws. Um, however, it has minimal impact on schools. Um, but it creates a new section of the penal law under the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act, um, which also does not have much impact. Basically, you cannot use marijuana on school grounds. The impact on employment actions is that you may not discriminate based on marijuana use during off hours. There are three exceptions. Um, employer's actions were required by state or federal statute, regulation, ordinance, or other state or federal governmental mandates. Employer's action would require employer to commit any act that would cause the employer to be in a violation of federal law or would result in the loss of federal contract or federal funding. And then the employee is number three, is impaired by the use of cannabis while working that decrease or lessen the employee's performance of duties or tasks of the employee's job position or such specific articulable symptoms that would interfere with an employer's obligation to provide a safe and healthy workplace free from recognized hazards as required by state and federal occupational safety and health law. Phew. Mm -hmm. So it is considered a controlled su substance, marijuana that is, under federal law, but New York State permits recreational use of marijuana. So that's where it got a little, I mean, tangled up. and. Um, there were lots of questions. Um, there was also um, there were also people on Zoom um, that were participating in this, and um, I could go into like all the things that are that were asked. But there were a ton of questions, um, and I you know will certainly send you the uh, results of the minutes so that you could see them. Um, but the biggest wonderful thing that happened was that um, somebody asked about training, and there is training through um, DITEP, is that how you say it? 
Um, and Penfield has used this program, and so everyone was told to contact Tom Putnam for the details. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, and I will send them directly to Brandon Fox, <laughs> our uh, <laughs> security and preparedness manager, who's in attendance this evening. So, um, but it, but it was, you know, I will just share is we've been spending a lot of time internally around the legalization of marijuana in New York State and the impact on our students, like our code of conduct, how things have to be written. Um, you know, for me, it's really the comparison of alcohol. You, yeah. you, you have to be 21 and it's not allowed in school. And the same would be uh, for, for marijuana, legal or not legal, it's still not allowed in school and our students are not uh, 21, so there, there should be no reason. And we would work through that like we do for, for other violations of a code of conduct. But a lot of it is around education. So it's, it's kudos to our Delphi RISE partnership we have mm -hmm. and working with our Delphi RISE drug and alcohol counselors um, to really get some things out in terms of education, education to parents and to students. Um, I think it's good, but this was all focused on labor, so it's really around the staffing side of things. Like, what, what does that mean for staff? And uh, Barb hit it, which is, is it similar to you know alcohol? You you yeah. can't bring it into work and drink it. And right. so, so the same thing applies, but it's just making sure that that we sort of understand as we move forward and, and things are changing. And I would just say, related to this is I just wanted to say, and the board's aware is um, just a thank you to Marie Sinti, our new town supervisor in Penfield. I've been meeting with her. Uh, now regularly since she took office and, and one of those pieces we've talked about is is Penfield the town uh, did uh, vote to allow for marijuana sales uh, when everything does get worked out with the Office of Cannabis Management out of New York State but they declined to allow for what they refer to as social clubs so a place like you could actually go and consume mm -hmm. and so they are working very hard uh, on the zoning around establishments to make sure they do everything in their power as a town to make sure that establishments are not in like walking distance of our schools and so you know they're working through that there's a long way to go before official things happen from the state and and, and things are taxed and in that but um, you know it's a it's a good relationship with the town I think that's an opportunity yeah. just to share that I was able to share with her sort of what we had learned what we're looking at and again that education for our families and, and our staff and students is going to be important mm -hmm. Questions? Did, did no, I have a comment. Catherine? Oh, oh no, did you? All right, so oh, I'm, doing, okay. I'm done. Tom, I just wanted to point out that, um, or make a comment that I think it's very refreshing and wonderful that you've got that uh, uh, newfound, established me uh, regular meeting with our mm -hmm. new supervisor, mm -hmm. because partnerships are very important to us. Absolutely. And I think that's really. It sounds like you just got off on the, a great foot with her tenure and. Uh, it's just great to be able to give her a call or yep. and let her know what the concerns would be to, to the district, no matter what situation is coming down the pike. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. I think yeah. that's wonderful. So I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a very um, open and uh, proactive sort of communication and partnership. And so um, it's nice because I'll, I'll be able to relay either questions to the town uh, or from the town to the board as well as things come up. So. Wonderful. Good. Good. Thank you. Okay. Which brings us to some new business. The first is the appointment of uh, Deputy Claims Auditor. Education law requires that the school district and BOCES boards of education audit and approve each claim prior to payment. The district utilizes a claims auditor to perform this requirement. In the event that the claims auditor is not available, a deputy claims auditor can step in and perform the duties of the claims auditor. The district recommends appointing Judy DiMagno to uh, the position of the deputy claims auditor. So may I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education ex point, appoint Judy DiMagno uh, to the position of deputy claims auditor. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, motion carries. The next new business is tied to the uh, what we discussed earlier, which is the masking, uh, the changes to the masking, but again, that's the, just the one part of the guidance. There is the impact of our reopening plan that is impacted by that, you know, to uh, the reopening plan is, spe is pretty specific about masking. Um, and now we have, as part of 
coping with uh, COVID, we created a policy in October of 2020 that basically said we will follow state, federal, and county rules. Uh, and it also, you know, it said we will, ad uh, the superintendent will enact the policies, uh, and I'm, say, I'm sorry, the, uh, the protocols necessary to comply with those. And they could be adjusted as necessary. So as this, um, as Governor Hochul had kind of started sending the message out that that, that would go away, our general counsel uh, also provided a resolution for us to consider if we choose to. So, you know, basically, you know, the first thing is, uh, again, there's more than just the mask. There is all the other aspects of it, which Dr. Putnam talked about earlier. So the question is, from a board perspective, uh, do we feel that the policy itself is uh, gives Tom, the, the um, Dr. Putnam, the latitude and direction to make the changes necessary, or do, does do we want to have this resolution? And that's and and really that's the discussion. And, and the like I said, you've you've got the resolution before you. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so, uh, and, and I think after a little bit of discussion, if there's an interest, I can read it off. But uh, before we before we you know go any further. So I mean, uh, so this is really to the board. What? what Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do, do you? Um, and you may not know the answer to this question because everything is, you know. But do you know what's going to happen with these reopening plans? Like, are they just going to be gone? Are they going to, like, do you have any inkling of what's coming down in this FAQ document regarding that? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I don't. Our understanding, though, in speaking with our, our contacts in, in Albany is that the guidance is going to address the fact that masking is optional. And so the reopening plan uh, would still need, we believe, still need to be updated to, to basically change required to, to um, optional. I, I would tell you that I, I think it's fair that there is um, not like a, a COVID police that's going to be reading reopening plans and saying you didn't change it but it's best practice to change it. So so this resolution came from legal counsel, the district's legal counsel, to really just uh, say, uh, it, it really, the big piece about it is that it gives the board, it directs the board, sorry, it has the board direct me to update the school improvement plan, or the um, school reopening oh plan in order to um, uh, shift that to optional. Um, and, and I, you know, as, as we look at our survey data, I didn't have a slide, um, uh, you know, our survey data that we did for stakeholders being uh, students in 6 through 12, because they bring their devices home and have access to email, um, and our staff and our families. You know, we were at um, uh, about 55% um, wanting optional and 45% um, wanting required. There's a lot of caveats in the required, like keep it re like in the comments. It was like keeping it required for those who are not vaccinated, and you know we made it clear in the survey like we can't. There's no way for us to to determine that and, and keep that track of that. So I think you know I would tell you I've been this is with everything as we talked about earlier, the change came and that we're still awaiting guidance. So so where we are now is the same with this resolution that came out from. Um, legal services, I think on Sunday night or Monday morning, um, and now we have a board meeting today. So, you know, in terms of where we're at, I've reread the policy. I think we, um, you know, I can, the, the, our policy is pretty clear that we're gonna follow the, the state mandates. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna overstep, but as superintendent, I, I am fine. I think we're comfortable holding off on the resolution. Um, until we are able to see the guidance, take a look, and maybe the resolution has to change. So I, I would share that just from looking at this, uh, you know, again, it happened fast, so. Thank uh, you. And then again, the, the general counsel provided this. She did not say. It's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. Nope. You know, it's not, it's not a, something we've got to do for uh, like insurance purposes or the nope. like. And I, and I would tell you too is that, the, you know, the resolution saying that we're going to follow the state mandate you know, even if the entire board voted no to that resolution, it doesn't change the fact that tomorrow's optional masking right. because there's no additional policy um, created. So, so it's really more of just, I think, um, um, 
putting it out and making it clear and again giving the superintendent the directive i think our policy does cover that mm -hmm. and yeah, and yeah. um you know not all districts have a board meeting tonight so not all districts are looking at a resolution tonight because because they don't have a board meeting until next week or even the week after mm -hmm. so i'm comfortable just on on looking at this and, and the question is is saying let's hold on the resolution and then have to make sure that we have time to run it through and understand from legal counsel and s be able to review the guidance as it comes out yeah. on on what might need to happen okay so with so any any other discussion or if there's someone who's interested in uh, uh, moving forward with this resolution let me know and i'll read it so we can have a formal read and motion mm -hmm. no okay. so then we can just continue on is there any more discussion on this aspect of new business Okay, then I, as I think we can move on. We don't need to take any action. I think we're, what we already have in place um, allows us to manage the changes to the masking rules and the guidances when they come out. Any other new business? All right, with that, may I have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 7.48 p.m.? So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Meeting adjourned.